I cut my notes in half last week, and my sermon still went long. <laughs> as much as I hated to cut myself off mid-parable, you know, I suppose that was God's mercy on you guys. That was going to be a long sermon. But as we come back to this text, we recall how Jesus is uh, comparing his kingdom, the kingdom of God, to a wedding feast. This is the third in a series of Jesus' parables, uh, replying to the chief priests and the elders that had challenged Jesus' authority. And Jesus is now demonstrating that those who ought to have been first to accept the kingdom, first to accept this invitation into Christ's kingdom, rejected the offer or ignored it shockingly. But those who were far off, those who you would have least expected to respond to this good news, those are the ones responding to this good news. That's what we find ourselves doing here. And we discussed how beautiful this wedding is going to be and how it likens to our welcome home celebration to heaven someday that will come for each of us. And how that compares to the invitation Jesus has given us to his kingdom of God. However, if all are invited, and clearly they are, as we outlined in our scripture uh, this morning in our preaching last week, how do we make sense of this character that we're introduced to in verse 11, where again it says, but the king came in to look at the guests, and he saw there was a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. The king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So we must ask ourselves, wait a minute. (laughs) This guy accepted Jesus' invitation. He's at the wedding. Why is he getting thrown out now? Does this make sense? And this is somewhat confusing to us as we read here. Almost, what, what lesson are we supposed to gain from this analogy? Why is he getting thrown out? But it makes sense to us, it would have made sense to the culture at the time, perhaps more so than it would to us. You see, there was this urgency to accept this invitation in the preceding verses. The original guests were not worthy and they refused to come. And so this last minute invitation is being sent out. Come to this wedding invitation. Come to this proverbial wedding feast. Uh, but you need to respond now. It's happening. There's no time to go home and change your clothes. You need to come now. And before we proceed, there is a beautiful parallel to us as Christians as well. Uh, You see, there is also this invitation to respond with urgency to Jesus's request, his invite into his kingdom. We're told the good news of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ And we don't know how long we have to respond to this invitation. We talked about this last week. We don't know how much time we have. Jesus could come back today or tomorrow. We could, something could happen today. We're not promised even the end of today. We need to respond to this good news now. Isaiah, what is it? Blanking on the verse now. 55 talks about how we have to respond today while there is still time. You know, I guess I'll, Come back to that later. But uh, but we too have this urgency to respond. And so since that is the same case with this parable, and people are showing up to this proverbial, this parable of a wedding feast unprepared, the king would have understood that, of course, especially back then. And the king would supply garments for his guests so that they would appear proper, considering the last-minute nature of such a request. And so therefore, the only way to enter into the king, king's feast wasn't to bring your best or present yourself in the best that you have. It's to come and then be clothed in the garment that is provided to you. That's the point of our first reading from Isaiah 61, which I had actually hoped to get this far in last week. That's why I had to repeat our first reading as well. Because I think this captures the point. 
where it says, I will rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in God, for he has what? He has clothed me in the garments of salvation and covered me with the robe of righteousness. We are under his covering for salvation, his covering for righteousness. So no, we come, we don't dress ourselves up the best that we can and then present ourselves to God. No, we humbly come as we are and ask to be covered and clothed in his righteousness, not something I provide for myself and try to present my best to God. No, God sees us as the broken people that we are and we receive his clothing of salvation, his covering for our righteousness. Romans 3.21 is another great verse that really hammers this home where it says, but now we have the righteousness of God that has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Christ, in Jesus Christ for all who believe. See, this is what all of this imagery is pointing to. We all have sinned. We all have fallen short of the glory of God. None of us have earned our own standing before God dressed in our own righteousness. That's why pastors like myself, you know, often keep hammering this point home. It's not about works. It's not about works. It's not about works because it's not about works. (laughs) You see, heaven isn't something that our works, that we can earn by our works, Heaven is something we are disqualified from because of our works. We don't earn heaven by our works. We are disqualified from heaven because of our works. We, it's, not, we, it's not something we can earn from, from it. However, the good news is this. A great exchange took place on the cross where Jesus took all of my sin upon himself on the cross. And in exchange, he gave us the gift of his righteousness. My sin for his righteousness. This great exchange took place, the most one-sided deal of all time. 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us about it. It says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In other words, Jesus, God on the cross treated Jesus as though he committed my sins. And now when God looks at me, he doesn't see my sin anymore. That was nailed to the cross with Christ. When God looks at me now, he doesn't see all of my prior brokenness, all of my prior sins. He now sees this gift of righteousness that covers me from Christ Jesus. He looks at me and sees Jesus' life in me. God looks at me now as if I lived Jesus' life because God looked on the cross and treated Jesus as if he lived my life. That's this great exchange that took place. And that is how As Christians, we are saved, having our sins taken from us and being blessed with this gift of righteousness. See, it's not enough to just have our sins forgiven. That's what got us disqualified. But now we have to have this righteousness, this gift of righteousness to make us acceptable before God given to us. So our sins were paid for, they were taken place, but now I'm also viewed as not just sinless, but righteous before the a holy and perfect God, because he sees the righteousness of Christ in me. That is the good news, and that is how we are saved. There's this fairly new hymn that says, uh, "Before the thr- that, that it, it's entitled, Before the Throne of God Above, that says, Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free, for God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me to look on him and pardon me. And I heard of uh, one pastor who was invited to dinner by a new member of his church. And the guy gave him the location, the name of the restaurant, agreed to a time. And this is pre-internet, and that comes, comes in handy, an important part of this story in a little bit. But he gives him the location, the name of the restaurant, and they agree to a time, and so they go. 
Uh, the pastor, however, you know, gets stuck in meetings, as they often do. And uh, so he rushes right from the church afterwards. He slowly shows up pretty casual to the restaurant and uh, realizes right away, this restaurant is not casual. <laughs> you ever been to one of those places? <laughs> and so he becomes suddenly very aware that he's underdressed. And suddenly realizing why the new member was so insistent on him paying. <laughs> the pastor couldn't afford the meal couldn't have, and was totally underdressed for the equa- a- occasion. He's not even dressed enough to be a waiter at this establishment. What is he to do? Now, fortunately, in this particular case, this particular restaurant has seen people like him before. He comes and he apologizes and says, is there anything you can do for me? And they say, why, yes, we can. They go in the back and they bring out this beautiful jacket. And they put it around him. And if I remember the story correctly, he said, this particular pastor said, it was better than the jacket he already had at home. High quality stuff. And I, I love that story. Because everything about it screams grace to me. This guy earned none of it. Yeah, how he, he, there's grace in providing the covering so that he could enter. Grace to cover the meal he couldn't afford. And my friends, that is the gospel in a nutshell. See, we can't enter in. We cannot pay for this. It's all beyond us. We're all underdressed and under and underfunded in our righteousness. It must be provided to us. That is the good news of the gospel this morning, that we're all spiritually bankrupt, but Christ has provided more than enough so that we can be in his presence, clothed in his righteousness and not our own. But you could easily imagine that story ending differently. Imagine for a moment if that pastor's experience had been different. Instead of apologizing and asking for help in humility, imagine if he walks in there, waltzed in there confidently, demanded service, and expected to pay with an expired credit card. One could imagine quite a different story. (laughs) In fact, we don't have to, you know what they would say to him? They wouldn't say anything to him. They'd just pick him up and toss him out like the garbage. Tossing him out, get out of here. And much like we discussed last week, it's not your outer presentation that matters. It's not how you show up that matters. It's your heart. It's your attitude. It's will you accept this gift of grace or not? And I think that that picture describes this person in our par- in this half of the parable today. You see, the fact that he didn't bring a wedding garment, it's not his fault. Nobody had one. His problem was that he refused to receive one. That's the difference here. If we're interpreting this passage correctly, and I believe we are. I spent a lot of time with this. At some point, this man was offered the proper attire in this wedding analogy. And he must have said at some point, no thanks. I'm good. I I am provided with enough. I'm good as I am right now. I'm just going to walk on in and enjoy the party. Thank you very much. This is a brilliant parable because it, it expresses what it looks like when we say back to God when he were presented with this gift of his gospel, no thanks. I'm good. I'm a good person. I don't need your covering, Jesus. I'm good enough as I am. I'll take care of my own righteousness. I, I got my problems on, but I'm good. But they're going to be tossed out of the restaurant just like that uh, guy who tried to pay without an expired credit card seems to be blissfully unaware that he is unable and unworthy of what, what he's being presented with. 
You know, some people think that someday they're going to stand before God and give him a piece of their mind or somehow barter with God and, you know, have some kind of clever excuse for why they don't believe or refuse to believe. That's not what the Bible pictures, though. No, in reality, we're going to be like that. Any, anyone like that will be like this man, speechless before God. So as we said, God, we hinted at this earlier during our confession. Like, when you stand before true holiness, you understand how unholy you are. We realize how poor our excuses really are. And without the righteous covering of Christ to cover us, it's going to be a sad day. You know, I'm not going to belabor this point. I've said this before, but too often we compare ourselves to other people, other good people, and say, yeah, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm good like this person over here. Or, or you know, I, I'm, I'm no war criminal. I'm not a horrible person. I'm not like one of those bad guys. You know, I'm a good person. I'm okay. We're slow to compare ourselves with a truly good person, though. I notice some people say, like, oh, I'm not Hitler. I don't do all these bad things. I don't see people doing the reverse. I don't see people saying, man, you know, I'm just not any Mother Teresa. I'm not as good as I could be. I'm not as good as I should be. We ask the wrong question. Because it makes us uncomfortable when we word it that way. But without the, and without the righteousness covering of, that Christ has provided for us, one day we, we would stand before God like this man did, like Job did at the end of his story. If you read that, cha- that, that book of the Bible, towards the end of Job, just as Job thought he had a couple of questions for God, God shows up with some questions for Job. In chapter 38, he shows up with 77 questions, none of which he had an answer for. After two chapters of just unrelenting questioning, Job just covers his mouth and is speechless before God. Likewise, this man is going to, is, in our parable this morning, is speechless and is cast into the outer darkness. That sounds uncomfortable. What's he talking about? What's this outer darkness? Well, I remember from my Boy Scout days where we'd have a roaring fire going in the middle of the night. And you know what? We had no problem seeing in our campsite. We, we, the fire warden was nearby. He'd get a little nervous. Let's put it that way. <laughs> but, I, but if you, we were to walk back to our tent, it would start to get a little dark. You couldn't see as well. And then if you walk outside of the campsite, there's even less light. And if you walk way out way out into the into the woods where you can just kind of see that fire way off in the distance. But it's not really helpful to you anymore. It's just kind of the speck on the horizon and it's, we're surrounded by darkness. That's what the Bible means by outer darkness, where you are so far removed from the light that it, you, it's not even helpful anymore. That's outer darkness. And that's the kind of darkness Jesus warns of for those who reject him, a place of darkness and gnashing of teeth. Another uncomfortable way of describing the torment of the day for those who refuse to accept this covering that is offered to us. And this should serve as a warning to those who are Christian in the cultural sense only. And we talked about somebody last week who considers themselves a cultural Christian. Oh, I love the beautiful cathedrals of, that Christians have built. I love the, the, the beautiful lofty hymns that Christians sing, but I don't actually believe in God. Or perhaps not even going that far. That's a unique circumstance, I believe. But I think this refers to somebody who maybe, maybe didn't mistreat the messengers God sent coming back to the imagery of this uh, reading this morning. But some, maybe someone who even said yes to the invitation at some point said, yes, you know what, I will consider myself a Christian, but didn't actually respond to the gospel, didn't respond to this good news. Someone who said, yes, I'll come, but on my terms. Someone who perhaps knows there is a God, but is unwilling to admit to themselves and most importantly to God that I am a sinner in need of salvation. That I'm not just, oh, I'm good on my own or I'll cover myself with my good works. 
someone who says, no, I, I am broken. And I need you, Jesus. I need your love. I need your salvation. I need to come clothed in your righteousness, not mine. That's the heart we're called to have, that this parable of Jesus is calling us to. But I also think it's interesting that this parable demonstrates the limits of this come-as-you-are motif that we have, which I think is mostly right. Yes, come as you are. Come to God. Knowing that as you approach God, as we are, we are ineligible to enter. But it will be provided to us. Trusting in Jesus alone is the only way to be saved. Which, by the way, Ed, I'm not a big fan of the high church model for that very reason. You know, people dressing themselves up extremely well, bringing their best, even as we gather in churches, you know, let's put our best before God. You know, our best is only considered filthy rags, right? It sends this mixed message. You know, we we come as Christ calls us. We come not seeking to show off my righteousness, but to say, Lord, I am broken and I just need you. That's why... All are welcome to the gospel and all are welcomed here for that very reason. However, you know, we said before, come as you are. We come now with all of our brokenness. We don't try to clean ourselves up and then come to God. We come to God and he cleans us up. That's how it works. But we don't come as you are presumptuously. We, nobody's going to waltz into the kingdom of heaven acting like they own the place. Nobody's going to walk in without an attitude of humility. With this pre- presumptive arrogance that this person has, party crashing, if you will. Rather, the person who will enter on that day, clothed in Jesus' righteousness, as we enter into he- the heaven's gates someday, what's going to be on our minds is, Really? I'm welcomed here? I can, I, I can be welcomed into this place? I don't deserve this? Wow. That's going to be the attitude of each of us who enter in on that day, clothed in his righteousness, apart from the law, apart from our works, and entirely rooted in grace. What a beautiful note that is. And it would seem that we could end on a happy note there. If it wasn't for verse 14, where it goes on, our parable ends with these words. For many are called, but few are chosen. The summary statement of this parable is for many are called, but few are chosen. As we think about the servants who were originally invited to the feast, but would not come. We think about those who were called again, but mistreated and killed or ignored this gospel invitation. We think about those who came in, who were coming in from the highways and the byways just as they are. And we think of this interesting character who comes in somehow without a wedding garment. And Jesus says, for many are called and few are chosen. Jesus, it was all making sense until you threw that line out there. (laughs) Let's be honest. I know I'm not the only one who thought that. (laughs) But, and because now we have to grapple with this divine mystery of election. What does it mean to be called by God to his kingdom? And more so, what does it mean to be chosen? And then there's a billion other questions we can ask. Do we choose God or does God choose us? Do we only choose God because God chooses us? And man, that's a philosophical question that has confused the church for 2,000 years. It still doesn't have a consensus. You can go to various different churches and they'll nuance the question differently. So considering the history, the history of Christian thought, the theology, the philosophy uh, that goes into understanding uh, this difficult topic, for the next 14 hours, what I want to do is... I'm kidding, I'm kidding. (laughs) Bad joke, I'm sorry. What I'm not kidding about is it takes that kind of time to really give yourself an introduction to really understand these things. I was a philosophy major in college, and I still only hit the tip of the iceberg. So I'm going to 
simplify this as simple as we can and keep it practical rather than letting this devolve into a philosophy lecture. Many are called. In fact, everyone is called in this invitation. The word many can mean all depending on its context after all. And it says here, you know, the, the, this parable even says, you know, go, go into all the main roads, go to the highways and the byways, invite everybody in, call everyone in to this kingdom. So we can kind of make sense of that. That's the general call. All are called to respond to this wonderful good news. But what does it mean that few are chosen? Well, Ephesians 4, 1 gives us a hint. It says, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Speaking about personal salvation, that God shows us in him before the foundation of the world. The Bible absolutely affirms God has a sovereign choice regarding our salvation, and the Bible affirms our free will, that we need to choose him for salvation, as this very parable suggests. And with that, we've opened Pandora's box. How do we affirm both? How do we make sense of both? So again, if, to keep this as simple as possible, if you want to be the chosen, if you want to be sure that you have been chosen in God before the foundation of the world, if you want to be in that category, choose him. That's right, choose him. If you want to be the chosen, choose him. Jesus says in John chapter 6, those who come to me I will by no means cast out. So if you choose him, you're the chosen. It really is as simple as that. But if you don't have any interest in God and you don't want to choose him, perhaps you're not chosen by God. Someone might say, well, that doesn't seem fair. I don't want, I I want to be God's chosen. Okay, will you choose him? No. No. Too bad. (laughs) I guess you're not the chosen then. You know, if you change your mind and choose him, then you're chosen. (laughs) I know it seems circular, but it really is true. From a practical standpoint, it is that simple. We have to make that choice. And again, if you've got 14 hours, I'll dialogue with you. We'll go deep into the history of philosophy and theology, and we'll break that all down. But it really is that simple. God is not going to cast you out if you really do choose him. And you will be welcomed in on that day. So those who do choose him will be clothed in a righteousness apart from the law and welcomed into the wedding feast that is eternal life in heaven. That is the good news. Those who come to him will enjoy him, will be secure in him. So the good news is you are invited. Do you choose to accept? Thanks be to God.